Health workers' strike is not a new phenomenon in Nigeria. These essential workers have embarked on multiple industrial action to drive home their demands, and up to today, they're still clamoring for an uh, improvement in the health sector. Now, today is the seventh day of the industrial action initiated by the National Association of Resident Doctors due to the same old issue of unmet demands by the federal government and Nigerians are made to bear the brunt. Now, many Nigerians have been left without poor, without proper uh, medical attention due to uh, this action putting their lives at risk. Now, this association says that the government needs to address the implementation of one-for-one -one replacement policy for healthcare workers, immediate payment of all salary arrears, implementation of a consolidated medical salary structure, a new hazard allowance, among others. So this is the crux of our discussion. Yes, and joining us from or via, uh, you know, joining us via Zoom is medical doctor Uludari Marindotti. Uh, Dari, it's good to have you join us this morning. Uh, good to have to you know be talking to you again, Mike. Uh, thanks for having good. me. Great. Now the the Nigerians are quite concerned, are really concerned with the issue of uh, resident doctors going on strike. But on the other hand, if you look at the the demands from the medical doctors. They've been through so much. And uh, the point there is government should be able to see from their own side of the story. And government, on the other hand, is saying they should also see from their own side of the story that uh, negotiations can go on, things can improve. But the, t the going on strike now was certainly not the right thing to do. I, I wonder what you make of this. Uh, thanks for that question. I'll try to address this, uh, you know, making a point for both the government and the ARD without talking on both sides of my mouth. Uh, funny enough, you know, I was watching the, the the clip she was showing and one of my classmates was one of the doctors seated in there. So, you know, we have to actually look at what these resident doctors are asking for, especially let's, I, I will try and start eating this more and more from this flat part before we get to the major issue of salary increase. You know, the hazard allowance is something that came into light during the COVID pandemic where the minimum minister then, I think Ehanire, was asked by the current, you know, uh, chief of staff to the president about the hazard allowance and he was he just tried to trivialize it. You know, this is something, this is the battle that the resident doctors have been on even for like decades, for over 20 years right now, getting just 5,000 as hazard allowance. They wanted an upward review of that. And it's not just going to be for the resident doctors, it's going to be for all healthcare professionals. You know, this is a, uh, uh, you know, a demand that I think the administration needs to look critically into and also look towards, you know, granting or reviewing and, and all of that. And, you know, they also spoke about the their uh, salary arrears. It is very, this is a, this is a, you know, something that is very uh, personal to me that I feel so dispassionate about because I also experienced it. It does not, I mean, it is so unconscionable that, uh, you know, employers sometimes don't pay salaries. I know the federal government is not owing people salary, but I think some state governments are actually owing salaries. But this is not something that is actually new, uh, isolated to the medical profession. It is in all professions in Nigeria. And my own suggestion is that, you know, I believe the House of Rep, the legislators can, you know, give Nigerians like a fair liberal standard act that's going to regulate all these things. My own, suge my own suggestion is even to to, you know, punish it because when you think about it, if you don't pay your staff, it's like you're taking a loan from them. So if you are taking the loan from them, you should pay interest on that loan. So if you don't pay them for one month, you pay a certain percentage, like 50%. And then if you don't pay them for the next month, you pay 50% of what you are owing for not paying the one month, you know, so that it can actually discourage this. And, you know, we can have this paid up in all sectors, private and public. And also they talk about, they spoke about their medical uh, residency training fund. This is also something that is standard practice everywhere in the world. You know, they, they, these, these people have two colleges that they have to take exams with. Exam for one is maybe 450,000, they have to pay the same for, for, for one. They go and do research methodology about another 400,000, they have to pay the same for the second one. They have to do updates, maybe around 120,000, they have to go attend conferences. And the federal government is not giving them the totality of this money. It's just subsidizing it. 
I think maybe the, the MTCR is maybe like around or less than 500,000 or something. This is, a, this is something that the, the, med, the, you know, I believe the government should pay, should pay without even preconditions, not even using it as a bargaining chip. Because from my own conversation with some of my colleagues, I kind of feel like they have a higher degree of sentiment when it comes to this, because, you know, they've incurred this bill and it is a money that has been promised to them. And if, like the previous uh, Minister of Labor was saying, if anybody is wondering why people should pay doctors to for their training, it is like going to be tantamount to asking your child, why am I paying you for your uh, school fees? Because when these doctors get trained, they are going to save the life of a child that is coming to the world. They are going to save the life of a pregnant woman. They are going to save the life of a, you know, uh, what's it called, uh, an elderly person, an accident victim. So the the, the government is training them so that they can provide services for you and me or the people living in Nigeria. So this is uh, this is something that is very, very key that I feel that they need to listen to. Now, as regards brain drain and one-on-one, -on -one, one ratio, one replacement of doctors and nurses, because they are not just fighting for doctors, they are fighting for no doctors and nurses. While, while this is supposed to be a duty for the uh, what we call federal government. I don't think the ARD has the powers to really, really, uh, you know, force anybody to employ, really. But I think what they can do is that they can restrict their own working hours. Doctors work between 60 and 80 hours a week, and that should be fair. So if an ARD president, I mean, person or a doctor has worked within 60 to 80 hours a week, I'm pretty sure nobody wants to see a doctor that is burnt out, because then that doctor is putting the life of this patient at risk. But ARD can find a way to enforce this. It is going to cause a lot of, you know, problem in the system because they are very understaffed. These guys work 24 hours for weeks. I was once in that position where I worked 24 hours for four straight weeks. Like, I, I don't even know how I did it when I think about it. So now think about someone, and then I was a young man, now think about someone who has a wife, who has children, and still has to, you know, live through all of these things. So definitely the government needs to look into all of this, but I don't think ARD going in, going on strike right now is so beneficial. But the truth is that doctors are the most passionate about their patients. So if the federal government tries to you know negotiate, at least pay the medical residency training funds. In my own opinion, I think they will have a lot a lot of you know goodwill from from ARD and the negotiation about the salaries and every other thing that they are talking about those ones can be brought home because that salary thing is also, uh, you know, a general thing that I'm pretty sure the NLC is talking about, the whole country, you know, is talking about. And I heard, like, the NLC is trying to go on strike also. And, you know, it's just, they just need to be patient with the government, in my own opinion, as regards the salary thing, because I also feel like the government needs to restructure the funding and the management of hospitals in general. So that we can have equitable, you know, service delivery all across the country, which is definitely not something that is not directly related to this particular strike that they are going on. But this, the salary thing is something that needs to also be reviewed. But they can't get the 270 percent, or as they were, they are asking for actually, they want a review, they want an upward review to the value of what it was in 2009. In 2009, Naira was like maybe 150. Naira right now is about 800. You know, that's like more than times four, times five. The Nigerian GDP did not grow by even times two. So you know, we can't achieve that. But I feel like the way the administration can, you know, get not just the doctors, all Nigerians together is to try to maybe get get a town or get some, you know, expert economists who are already working with the president to try and educate the doctors are smart people, Nigerians are smart people. They can understand that all these policies, the subsidy removal with the unification of interest rates, it will eventually bring down the value of the dollar against the Naira. So once that Naira appreciates, then your disposable income, your purchasing power increases, your disposable income increases also because Nigeria is still an import economy. So the price of goods will also go down and then the value of your money is going up. So this, and these are the things that, and I'm so happy that the president did not waste time in initiating it because, you know, when it comes to currency, it goes up like rockets, it comes down like feathers or, or prices of everything in, in general. So it's going to take time, but Nigeria is in a mud. 
the only way out of the mud is through the mud. And that's what the president is trying to do. He's trying to pull Nigeria, Nigeria through the mud so that we can get to you know, better ground. Nobody is going to stay in the mud and say, I want the ground to be hard for before I step out. So Nigerians need to be patient, and most especially you know, resident doctors. But I believe if their medical residency trust uh, be training fund can get the bus to them because that is the money that they have been promised and they are being owed. I all believe right. this will you know, go a long way in giving the federal government oh, a, oh, a leverage. Right. Oludari, let me also take you further, uh, take you up further on your earlier points about uh, the replacement of uh, medical personnel. This is among the demands which you have um, also spoken on and, you know, given your, shared your thoughts on it. But really, uh, looking at the level of brain drain, the fact that this uh, doctors say they're, they're working for on, on duly long hours. And um, so there is a death of uh, medical professionals in the country. How then can government go about it if, if, if you feel it's not within the call of the resident doctors to, to, to make demands for, for this, if I take your point accurately? How then should government, where do they get the professionals from uh, to meet the shortfall? Yeah, you have to first address the root cause of the have to do a root cause analysis of this shortage and first address it. You know, a lot of these things, they ask for one to one. A doctor who has trained for like two years, three years, and then decided to leave to, for you know economic reasons. You cannot replace that doctor with a fresh graduate, you know. But when we, if we do a root cause analysis, there is actually you know a I think it's a national health resource uh, strategic plan that came out around like 2008 that pre predicted this thing because about 2007 Nigeria changed the way by which they are admitting students into the medical school. So we, they, do, they do something called indexing right now. There is a limited amount of students that, do, that medical schools could employ. And the rumor at the time, because I was already in medical school, was that this was done in, as a bargaining chip for increasing the salaries or whatever. You know, what happened is if you have reduced the number of students that you are training, the, the attrition rate will still be there. Nigerian doctors, not just Nigerian doctors, Indian doctors, doctors from poorer countries will still keep on going to the other clients. But if you have not decided to consciously reduce the number of people you are admitting, you have already caused a shortfall for yourself in the future. And that is what we are seeing right now in the Nigerian system. So they need to go back and review that policy so that they are training more doctors so that the attrition rates and the graduation rates, the, the attrition rate does not outpace the graduation rate. And that will put more, you know, a lot more doctors in the system. But another thing that, that I feel like the Nigerian government also need to do, and this is my own personal opinion, and I would love to argue this with people with majority who would disagree with me, is that I feel like the federal government in general, federal states or local governments, need to get out of the business of owning hospitals and get into the business of funding hospitals so that, you know, you don't just create a system whereby majority of Nigerian doctors are in the private sector anyways. If all the Nigerians that needed health care have to go to a public hospital, they won't even have leg space. So you can have public and private not-for-profit hospitals whereby care does not get denied to anybody because health care is a neighborhood thing. It's like you just want to go and buy Google and it, but that's how health care should be. You should be able to access health care in your neighborhood. So you will need private people who are going to deliver, who, who have agreed to deliver services to indigent patients. And the government should be funding them just the same way the government is funding a public hospital. And another benefit that the government will get from this is efficiency. I, uh, I will try to be politically correct, but I will say that because resident doctors are not permanent employees of the hospitals. But the permanent employees of the hospitals, who are the specialists, the consultants, they can come to the hospital more often than they do right now. And the reason why is because when it is a federal government job, then Ogata, Ogata, Uwala, Ruakwe, like Jirubak will say, that is to say, if the master sells or he doesn't, the headquarters wages, it will come in, it will, be, it will be paid in full. So there's that degree of nonchalance. But if the federal government restructures and let all these doctors, including the residents and all, and the nurses, everybody, to be employed by their hospital, my hospital system, Last week is the one employed hospital uh, people working for last week. Then they will be more efficient. They will make 
uh, decisions in that local space. If they need to employ doctors because they know that they have to give that service, they will employ doctors. And then the federal government can now base their payments and their you know, grants and everything on their performance and the patient's outcome and everything. And this will improve the general experience that everybody has in the hospital because I, I know that almost everybody will know someone or they themselves have had a terrible experience going to a Nigerian public hospital, government hospital. So these are some of the like, you know, restructuring and rejigging of the, you know, healthcare sector that Nigerians need to do. Definitely, everybody knows that for us to have the old full co coverage, we need the economy to be better. We need people to be in, to be employed. We need the youth, which is the strength that we have right now, to be trained, educated, so that they can have a job and then they can pay into the you know health insurance uh, post or pay taxes for health insurance and all. But in the interim, I feel like if the federal government can restructure and then support all hospitals, because they have responsibilities not just to the hospitals that you know render services for them. I mean, that they that they are managing, but to every everybody in the country. So in places where there are no federal government hospitals, a few specialists can come together, five of them, go to that place because they are from that place, start a hospital, render cheap service, and the federal government is going to support them the same way they are supporting, you know, federal government hospitals. And then the federal government hospitals that are a behemoth will be able to, you know, get all the equipment, the gadgets, everything that they need so that they can do businesses efficiently and even attend to, you know, the high class of the of the Nigerian society, which typically won't want to go to federal government hospitals because of the management structure and everything. So this is some, this is the way whereby the government can even prevent one strike crippling the whole system because everybody will have independent negotiations and contracts with their employers and all of that. So I think it might be, I mean, this is my own idea in terms of like solving this whole replacement and employment thing. But first, they will need to go back to fix that problem that was created about 15 to 15 years ago now, when they reduced the number of doctors that they are employing. We have a shortage, not just doctors, doctors and nurses too. They, are, they reduced, they, are, they gave them an index. So they need to go back and review that so that we are now training more doctors and training more nurses to meet our growing population demand. When we have not even spoken about the growth in population, we are still talking about attrition and uh, you know graduation rates. What about caring for the growing population that is projected to be you know to increase by fifty percent in maybe like another twenty years or something? So these are things that are salient that the federal government needs to get into. But I will still sue for peace in terms of like the the, the resident doctors should try and go back to work, but the federal government needs to show some goodwill and pay their medical residency training funds. I think that will give them a lot of goodwill in mm. convincing these doctors to okay. go back to work. That is my own opinion. All right. Now, what do you say to some persons who have argued that the government is just two months in office? Of course, they don't have um, ministers yet. Of course, they are being screened by the Senate so when it comes to understanding the details of how monies can be disbursed and some of the things, of course, some people have said that the government is a continuum, so it doesn't really matter. But on the other hand, the persons who are coming into government who are going to do the payments, who are going to listen to all of the, uh, uh, the demands and uh, cross the T's and dot the I's are just coming into office and they're just two months old and they have to look at how much the government has to meet some of these demands. What, what do you say to that kind of argument? That is a very, very valid argument that I feel like, you know, all good meaning Nigerians should consider, including resident doctors. The government is new. The administration is new. You guys gave a warning strike at the twilight of the last administration. And then, you know, this one, you've not, you, I mean, they should let this uh, administration get its, you know, get its feet on the ground to start running, you know, I'm pretty sure the administration is not complaining. The president said, I'm not complaining about it himself, said he danced for it. So I'm sure he's not complaining, but it is a valid thing in the, in the scope of, you know, the good good of all, the, you know, what I call the, the greater good for, you know, the ARD uh, members to also consider the fact that this administration is new, but also the administration has a responsibility to, uh, carry them along to explain to them, like when they're asking for 200 something percent increase in salary, 
go and meet them, explain the reason, take economists to them to explain the reason why this Naira is, is at this value and let them know what you are doing to try to fix the Naira. So if we are giving you 25% in increase in salary and we can fix the Naira to the point whereby it's maybe 50% of what it costs right now to buy a dollar, that has already more than doubled your own income just by doing that. So they can make those arguments to them and sue for time and sue for peace, but there is a need for a communication and getting everybody, now, not just the resident doctors right now, all Nigerians, getting them on board, to let them understand like that this subsidy that was taken away was a strategic move that is going to save us, that has already saved us a lot of money, but that is also going to help us treat our alien exchange rates. And then this unification of uh, for, you know, forex is also going to bring in a lot of foreign direct investment that will help us also boost our foreign reserve and help us treat our exchange rates. These are things that, you know, they are all going to work together. But if you don't explain it to the people and do a lot of PR job going on TVs, on social media, everywhere, talking about it all the time, the people will not understand it and then you won't be able to carry them along. But even as a medical doctor, I am able to get higher compliance to the regimen from my patients when I can explain to them their condition. I, do, I go on Google, read it, explain it to them. Then you see that they are, they are sticking to it because now they understand. So you need to let the people understand, use the simplest of terms, but be persistent, be repetitive about what you are doing so that they can see that in the end, this 25% increase that they are getting is going to be even worth more when all these economic strategies um, and policies that have been implemented start to yield the achieve the you know the uh, expected goal. So the government needs to do a lot more communication. You need to meet them. As a matter of fact, no need to send delegates to Abuja. Send the delegates to their you know annual general meeting to their general meeting to talk to them in their own domain in their own in their own comfort zone and explain it and have this debate with them and listen to all you know the myriads of complaints they have like the issue of uh, you know downgrading of their of their certificates so like after the past one they do two exams to become a consultant so after the first exam they usually give them a they call it a, a class B certificate. Then all of a sudden, the Medical and Dental Council decided to downgrade it to class C. Now, they asked for an explanation. The Medical and Dental, the FDCN never tried to even give them an explanation. So now, if the federal government is the one paying for residency training, and you are telling the federal government that what they are paying for, you want to downgrade it. I believe the federal government has a reason, I mean, has a responsibility not just to be, you know, to invest in medical training, but also to be interested in its investment in medical training. So the federal government can send a letter just to the MDC and explain to us why you are telling us we thought we paid for a Ferrari, a Ferrari. Now you are giving us Toyota Corolla. So explain to us why you have downgraded us from Ferrari to Toyota Corolla because we are paying for it. The federal government can do that. And they would have been seen by the residents who have been fighting on their side. And this will also get goodwill in the negotiation process from the fed, by, uh, by the federal government. The federal government will get goodwill from the resident doctors. And this will help them to you know, expedite the, the process of them returning back to school. These are things that people need to understand. So yeah. I feel like the federal government can do a lot more communication. But definitely, the administration is still young. And ARD should, you know, try to understand what they are trying to do. But the federal government has a responsibility to explain to them because if they don't explain dutifully and extensively, a lot of people will not understand. Right. So that's my and take on that. The, the issue of, let, let's quickly talk about um, impact of this um, latest cycle of um, strike. It appears to be, you know, total, even though observers have noted the presence of some consultants and house officers on ground across the uh, national or the federal or government-run hospitals. But then it, it does speak to the state of our national health insurance policy, doesn't, doesn't it? When you look at the options that um, patients now have, uh, from what we understand, only patients with um, you know, emergency care needs
are being attended to, albeit briefly. But, you know, the options left for uh, many Nigerians, especially those who cannot afford the private care uh, treatment, it does speak to the level of our national health insurance policy and, you know, what needs to be done. You know, help to speak in that regard, uh, Oludari. Yeah, yeah, it's you're, you're very right in terms of like our weak health insurance scheme. And that's why I, why I was talking about federal government funding all hospitals, because you want to know what, what's true. All these doctors that are on strike are actually not busy sitting at home. They are busy working somewhere else. Right. So if the federal government is actually supporting all hospitals, people will still have access to, you know, the to other to this to these facilities. There will not be a sequestration of patients in the federal government hospitals because they believe that is the only place or those are the only places where they can get, you know, cheap services. And there's not definitely a shortage of workforce in the system in general, but the the fact that the health if health insurance scheme is so poor, even those with health insurance, the health insurance in Nigeria, from my own experience, essentially takes care of you when you don't have serious problem. When you have serious problem, you still go broke, except if you are working with a multinational company, a big company that can afford millions of naira for your for your for your you know for your treatment. So these are some of the things that you know. The federal government rethinking the way they are funding healthcare in the hospital in general. I don't believe we should take completely the NHS model in the UK, or we should take completely the, the you know the HMO model, or the health insurance model in the United States. But we can find a, so a, an in between ground. But the essence would be for both federal government and state government to be funding all hospitals so that. People are not forced to only go. Like when I was working for my father, whenever something like this happens, we always see a, 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 you know an increase in patronage, and then later it, it dies down. But if the federal government has been funding all hospitals providing service to indigent patients, this would this whole you know uh, gridlock and everything will not have as much impact as it is right now. Mm. So funding a few hospitals and leaving the rest unattended has also worsened this thing. For health insurance to be truly achieved in Nigeria, the economic revolution that Tinubonomics is going to bring will need to work so that people have jobs. It's only people that have jobs that can pay into the pockets. Okay. For everybody that will now allow everybody to be able to access care. All right. We have to leave you here now. Thank you so much, uh, medical doctor, Dr. Oludari Marindasi, for joining us and uh, bringing out your insight into all of this. Thank you.